When we try to fill our lives with the things around us, the things of the world that make us feel good for a moment, we'll never be satisfied with the things of the world. Trying to fill that void in your life with the things of the world is like trying to fill a swimming pool with a medicine dropper, one drop at a time. On the other hand, we can fill that void in us with the one thing that is infinite and eternal, and that is God himself. This is season eight of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's grace from an evangelical Methodist point of view. God's holy word is central to all we believe, so let's get into God's word right now. Now let us hear the word of the Lord for us this day. This is uh, from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1. In verses 29 through 39, let us hear the word of the Lord for us this day. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we're continuing in our series called God With Us. Our theme verse for the series has been uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Throughout the season, series, we've been looking at how Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. We've been looking at how God interacted with us through the ministry of Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah. We've seen how, through Jesus, God calls us into a relationship with himself. We've seen how, through Jesus, God gives us a mission to bring others to a saving relationship with him. Jesus called it fishing for people. Last week we looked at how Jesus is the embodiment of God's word and how God's word is our authority, not just as Christians, but as God's creation. We who are made in God's image are called to live as representatives of God. And this week we are looking at how we seek God among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Have you ever spent time seeking something? Um, the, I find that the older that I get, the more time I spend looking for things, uh, especially things that I have lost, uh, my keys, my glasses, my cell phone, um, silly things, really. And I'll make myself crazy going all over the house uh, looking for it, only to find that my glasses were on my head, my keys were in my pocket, my cell phone I left in my car, you know. But we seek things. We seek things that are important to us. We seek things that we desire. 
all throughout our lives, we spend seeking God. And we might not ever know it. We might not even know that the thing that we seek most in this world is God himself, a relationship with him. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 3, it says that God has put eternity into the hearts of people. God has placed eternity in our hearts. And so we seek something that from the very beginning, from the very moment we are born, we are seeking something greater than ourselves. And that something can only be found in God. Now, some people spend their entire lives seeking it in things. Things that make them feel good for a moment. But those moments are passing. Those moments are fleeting. If we are to find true satisfaction in our seeking, then we ought to seek the thing which is eternal and infinite. Because when we try to fill our lives with the things around us, the things of the world that make us feel good for a moment, you know, we might see that big screen TV and I, that thing would look great in my living room, especially today for the Super Bowl, right? But once it's there, it looks a little bit smaller and smaller every single day. Especially when we go back to the store and we see an even bigger TV. We'll never be satisfied with the things of the world, is what I'm trying to say. Trying to fill that void in your life that God has placed within you with the things of the world is like trying to fill a swimming pool with a medicine dropper, one drop at a time. It'll never happen. Because the minute that drop hits the bottom of that pool, it evaporates. You'll spend an eternity trying to fill that pool with that medicine dropper, and you never will. On the other hand, we can fill that void in us with the one thing that is infinite and eternal, and that is God himself. And once we find God, that longing, that yearning in us is satisfied, and it's satisfied forever. Why? It's as if, um, as Augustine said in his confessions, that my soul is restless until it finds satisfaction in you, in God. My soul is restless until it finds its rest in thee, O God, is what he said. Today we're going to be looking at how we seek after God. And what we find is that in reality, it's not us who do the seeking. See, God put that eternity in our hearts. But the reality is, he's the one who's seeking after us. We're going to see that in a little bit. So a little bit of context, a little bit of background. And the setting here is still Capernaum. Last week, we left Jesus in the synagogue in, in Capernaum. And it tells us, uh, verse 29, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So they're, they're in the house of Simon and Andrew. A little bit about the, um, the, first, uh, the first century Jewish household. The household was made up of um, the main quarters, which was where the, the principal landowner would live. So that was typically the patriarch of the family. Either the father, the grandfather, whoever was the oldest living male would live in that main part of the house. Um, but the house also consisted of many other little dwelling places that were attached to it. And so whenever uh, a man would get married, he would... Uh, build a new place onto his father's household, and he and his bride would move in there. Now, we're told in this particular uh, passage that Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. Now, it's entirely possible. Um, Simon, by the way, is the only one of the disciples who, that we talk about as being married. He's the only one. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that the other disciples weren't married. It just means that we don't know that they were or they weren't. It's not mentioned in Scripture. Simon Peter is the only one that we know for sure was married. Um, and his mother-in-law was living with him. Now, that typically means that her husband had passed away. She was a widow. And so Simon Peter was fulfilling his familial obligation of taking care of his mother-in-law uh, when she needed uh, to be taken care of. But she was in bed with a fever. And they told Jesus about her that she was in bed with a fever. She was sick in bed. So what happened? Jesus came and he took her by the hand and he lifted her up. The fever left her and she began to serve them. Like, a, like every good mother, you know, she's sick in bed and she feels better. And what's the first thing she does? She starts taking care of the children, right? Well, that's basically what happens here. Jesus healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law and she began to serve them. Uh, it's an interesting uh, thought because when Jesus heals us, when Jesus heals us completely of our sin, what is it that we desire to do first? If you've ever met a, a, a brand new Christian, brand new in the faith, you know that their primary desire is to serve God in some fashion, whatever it might be. They start proclaiming the gospel to their friends. They start um, serving in the local church, doing anything that they can to serve the one who gave them back their life. That's what uh, um, Peter's mother-in-law has done here. She was sick. She was, um, she was healed. And immediately she began to serve them. Okay. Now verse 32. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick by, with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Very similar to what we saw in the synagogue. This is still the Sabbath day because it's still the same day. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went back to the house Jesus healed the mother-in-law. She began to serve them. The evening at sunset, okay, people started to bring them all, his, all the sick people. Why at sunset? Because sunset would have been the end of the Sabbath day. And they didn't want to risk. What's, what's the one thing that, that happened over and over again? Jesus would heal someone on the Sabbath day, and the people of the Sanhedrin would immediately start to rebuke him, and condemn him and say, this man's a sinner because he's working on the Sabbath day. You know, so the people waited till evening. The evening begins the next day for the for the Jews. OK, so the Sabbath would end at sundown at sunset. This is what it said at that evening at sunset. They brought to him all who were sick and possessed with demons. Well, he had cast out a demon earlier that day in the synagogue. So they knew that he was, there was something special about him. He's healing people of their infirmities. He's casting out demons. That's what he's doing. Okay. He heals many. But now we get to the part of this passage that I really want to focus on. Verses 35 through 39. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and he went out to a deserted place and there he prayed. Now Jesus is the physical manifestation of God. But he's not God the Father. He is God the Son. He is the second person of the Trinity. And as such, he is in constant communication with his Father. And how do we communicate with the Father? We communicate with the Father through prayer. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. Early in the morning, early in the morning, while it was still very dark. Now I imagine he was probably healing and casting out demons, demons late into the night. And so here it is early in the morning. He gets up 
while it's still dark, before the sun is up, he went to a deserted place. He got away by himself. And there he prayed. This is what we need to do. When we are in ministry, when we are serving in the church, when we are proclaiming the gospel to our friends, we need to revitalize ourselves. We need to rejuvenate ourselves. And how do we do that? We do that through fasting and prayer. We do that by getting away by ourselves with just the Word of God in our hands. And we allow God to speak to us, to minister to us. Okay? We need to be able to get away to by ourselves and pray regularly and it really helps if we do this first thing in the morning because it helps to set up the rest of our day. I know people who get out of bed and as soon as they roll out of bed, their knees hit the floor and they begin to pray. I used to do that on the regular, but I, I, I haven't done it um, uh, recently. And to my discredit, maybe I'll start doing it again. Maybe I'll make it a regular practice. Um, but it's true. We ought to be spending the first moments of our day in prayer with God. It's how we communicate. It's how we talk to him. It's how he talks to us. And so here's Jesus in a deserted place, and he prayed. Now, verse 36, Simon and his companions hunted for him. They didn't know where he went. He got up early in the morning. He left the house he, go, he went out to a deserted place. He began to pray. They were searching for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. <laughs> Truer words have never been spoken. Everyone is searching for Jesus, whether they know it or not. And now when they were talking to Jesus, they were just talking about the people who were in the town. Everybody's looking for you. Where did Jesus go? Where did he go? He just up and disappeared. We don't know where he went. They went and searched for him. Simon, P Simon Peter and the disciples found him and they said, everyone's searching for you. What is Jesus' response? He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. He said, let's keep going. We're not going to stay here in Capernaum this is not going to be the only place that I'm proclaiming the message. We're going to go town to town because they said everybody is searching for you. They meant everybody in Capernaum, all the people around us. People keep coming to the house and they're looking for Jesus. But the reality is what they said was true. Everybody, everyone is searching for Jesus. So Jesus goes to everyone. Because the reality of it is this. We think that we're seeking Jesus, or we think that people are out there seeking Jesus. But the reality is, it is Jesus that is seeking us. Think about the, uh, the parables in Luke chapter 15. There's three parables, three primary parables. The first parable is the parable of the old woman who she had 10 coins and she lost one. And she lit a candle and she swept the house until she found that, that coin. And when she found that coin, she went to her neighbors and she rejoiced and she said, come rejoice with me, I have found my coin which was lost. And Jesus finishes the parable by saying, so it is whenever a sinner repents and comes back to God. There is a celebration in heaven. You see, God is that woman searching for the lost coin. Jesus told another parable about a lost sheep. And the lost sheep, he said, Who among you who has a hundred sheep, when one of them wanders astray, you will leave the ninety-nine in the pasture and go and seek the one that is lost? And when you find it, you will put that sheep on your shoulders and you will carry it back and you will say to your friends, come rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. 
And he said, in the same way, there's a celebration in heaven. Anytime a sinner repents, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's what he came to do. He came to seek and to save the lost. And that's all of us before we come to Jesus. Every single one of us. And so, Jesus is the one who seeks us. The final parable in Luke chapter 15 is about the prodigal son. We know this one. The, the, the young man, he's, he's not even the oldest son, but he goes to his father and he says, I want my inheritance. Basically, he's saying to his father, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. I want, I want my inheritance. He takes everything and he, and he leaves. He goes to the city and he squanders it on riotous living. And then when he has nothing left, all his friends leave him. Party's over. He ends up going to work for a pig farmer. And he envies the pigs because of the food that he's slopping to them. And he says, back in my father's house, there are the servants eat better than this. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father and I will say to him, I have sinned against you and against God and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me back as one of your hired servants. And he goes back home and he's rehearsing this story, this, 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 this uh, confession the whole way. But it tells us that his father saw him when he was a long way off, which means he was looking for him. He was searching for him. And as soon as he saw him on the horizon, he got up and he ran. Jesus actually used that word. He ran. He ran to his son. And he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Now the boy is trying to get this confession out. Father, I have sinned against you and against God. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father is making praises. He says, here, kill the fatted calf. We're going to feast tonight. Put rings on his fingers and rings on his toes. And put, a, put the, my best robe on him. Then he says this, because he was lost and now he is found. He was dead and now he is alive. You see, the father is seeking for us. We think of ourselves as seekers. But the true seeker is God. And God is drawing us to himself by his grace. This is what Jesus came to do. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We often talk about seeking God. We want to be an accommodating church for those who come seeking. We typically talk about being seeker-friendly. That's the, the new term that churches use, being seeker-friendly. The truth is, it is God who is seeking us. And we call this prevenient grace. Even before we know who God is, or what it is that we are seeking, God is calling us to have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. God puts eternity in our hearts. And we have a desire for him that draws us to him. But he is the one who seeks us. God is the woman searching for the lost coin. God is the shepherd leaving the 99 sheep to seek the one who is lost. God is the father of the prodigal son looking out for his return. And when we approach the throne of grace to say, I have sinned against you. He embraces us and he kisses us and he brings us back into his family. We talk about seeking God among us, but the, really, the reality of it is that God is the one who is seeking us. Today, as we come to the communion table, let us rejoice that once we were lost and now we are found, let us bow down before our God who sought us and came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And let us remember the price that he paid to bring us back to him in the body and blood of Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you humbly, seeking to be re 
united, reconciled to you. We know that we have sinned against you. We have strayed from you. We have wandered from the fold. And yet you seek us, Lord. You seek to bring us back to you at all times. You're always calling out to us. And we, we resist your call. We see the glittering things of the world and we chase after those things. But it is only you and in you, Lord, that we find our satisfaction. Lord, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And so give us restless hearts that seek you more day by day. And drive us to our knees in the morning, Lord, so that we can thank you for another beautiful day. Every single day with you, Lord, is a beautiful day. And so, what more can we say, Lord? There are people who are out there who are seeking something. They don't even know what it is. Let them find it in you. And let them find you here in your church. All this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Guerrilla Christianity. My hope and prayer is that this time of listening to and learning from God's Word has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. And God has also blessed me in appointing me to serve two churches in Salem County, New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pedricktown. If you don't have a church family to call your own and you live in the area, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. We are a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring faith community in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. Ebenezer meets for worship at 9 a.m. and Hudson meets for worship at 10.30. We also have Bible study during the week. And right now during the COVID-19 crisis, we are meeting exclusively online through Facebook Live and we'd be happy for you to join us wherever you are. Of course, if you don't live nearby, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So I would encourage you to live out your faith with a group of like-minded believers wherever you are. Now, if you enjoy this podcast and would like to help support it, please share it with your friends and family. Hit like, leave a comment, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search for Guerrilla Christianity. Keep learning, keep growing. And I pray you will join us for Guerrilla Christianity again. Until next time, remember this. Christ died for you. Now go live for Christ.